Well, there was a true story I discovered about a retired couple a few years back who was alarmed by the threat of nuclear war. Every turn, time they turned on the news, there was a, uh, uh, another re report that suggested something was coming along the way. So they undertook, they were retired, they could go anywhere they wanted, they could live anywhere in the world. And so they undertook a serious study of all the inhabited and somewhat uninhabited spots on the globe. And their goal was to determine where in the world would be the one place in all the world least likely affected by war. They studied and they traveled and, and then they traveled and they studied and finally they found a place, a place of ultimate security. And on Christmas of 1981, they sent their church a Christmas card from their new home in the Falkland Islands. However, in 1982, for those of us who were watching news in 1982, you may remember that just four months later, their little paradise would soon become a very big war zone between Great Britain and Argentina as Argentine forces invaded and occupied the Falkland Islands. There's still restlessness in the world today. In our prayer time, we, we brought up those uh, hot spots. Governments are racing against time, trying to solve problems in the hope that they can somehow bring hope and peace to the world. So how's that working out? Well, we've, we've talked about ISIS. We've talked about the troubles and the unrest in Ukraine and about Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Peace, peace is so elusive, but not according to Scripture. Judges 6.24 is our key text this morning. You can see it on screen here. And you can also uh, uh, look at it online, if you wish, uh, off to the side there. But here it is, Judges 6.24. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there, and he called it Jehovah Shalom. Or, so Gideon built an altar, and he called it the Lord is Peace. Those of you who've been following our current series know that we're in a series called I Am. And in this series, we're looking at the names of God. We're looking at the characteristics that are, that are listed in his names. Now, we go open our English Bible, and we see the words what? God and Lord. But in the original languages as they were written, there's nuances in his names that we just don't get in the English. And so we've looked at, at names like Elohim, which means the amazing, awesome creator God. We've looked at Adonai, which means Lord, and that he has a personal name which is Yahweh or Jehovah. Now we're also now turning to compound names, where you're taking one of those names and combining it with something else, getting another facet of who God is. Last week we were reintroduced to Jehovah Jireh. The Lord is our provider. And this week we're looking at Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is peace. Now, the dictionary has a, a, a specific definition of peace, and the free dictionary online said it this way, peace is either the absence of war or hostilities, or maybe closer to home, freedom from quarrels and disagreements, or maybe even closer to home, an inner contentment and security and serenity. Now, we assume with this inner peace that we have inner peace if we have someone to love us and a good job and a nice home or no sickness. If we have all of those things, then we, we must have peace. If so, though, wouldn't we expect the rich and famous people to be very peaceful? But are they? Depression, drugs, chemical abuse, spousal abuse, physical abuse, verbal abuse... It's just as prevalent, if not more so. For those who can afford all of these nice things, they still don't have peace either. Now, these things are not unimportant. God expects us to try and make many of these things a reality. But the truth is, none of these will bring peace. In fact, if these things alone are the foundation for our peace, we will be frustrated forever and ever and never find peace. Isn't that odd? The very things we think bring us peace will never bring us peace if that's all we're looking for in life. It's been said, if you want the right answer, you have to ask the right question. I would suggest what will give you peace is the wrong question. And instead, we should ask who will give you peace. And that answer is found in Romans. Romans 5, 1 says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, the book of Judges is, is an interesting book. And right before it is the book of Joshua. And we did a study in the book of Joshua. And it tells the grand story of the beginnings of the nation of Israel. How they took the land God promised them and they served him. But Judges, the book that follows, 
A very sad book in comparison. Now it starts off well. Look at here, the Judges 2 7. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. That's a pretty good start to a nation, I would say. But then Joshua died. He died at the age of 110. And Judges 2 goes on to say, And after that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals, the other gods. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the people around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and they served Baal and the Asherah. The Asherah were groves of trees that were, uh, were grown specifically for worship, to worship the Baal and the other gods. You know, in fact, the book of Judges talks about seven cycles of trouble. They probably were many, many more, but they show us an example of just seven. And the pattern is always the same. It begins with peace and prosperity. Who wouldn't like peace and prosperity? But then that gives opportunity for what? Sin. And with sin, God allowed them to go into oppression. Other outside countries and nations would uh, uh, attack them. And then there was a case of, uh, of where the nation of Israel was sorry and they were repentant. And God would provide a deliverer, a judge, there by the name of the book, judges, a rescuer, if you will. And then there was peace. But then that brought the cycle all the way back again. And each time they, rep they repented, God sent a judge or a deliverer. The seven are Othniel and Ehud and Shamgar and Deborah and Gideon and Jephthah and Samson. Some of these names are very familiar to us. And every cycle begins with the same words. If you go look at the seven in, in the book of Judges, it begins with the words, And the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Those foolish Israelites, do they never learn? And yet, we're just like them. Because how often do we do things that are evil in the eyes of the Lord? And the book itself ends with this verse, this very verse. In those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did as they saw fit. That's a commentary on the whole nation of Israel. Everybody did what they wanted to do, what they felt comfortable doing. So seven times in the book of Judges, Israel finds that elusive peace, that elusive prosperity, only to lose it again. And we're going to look at one of those times this, this morning in detail so we can look up close as to what they fell into and how we can avoid doing the same thing. Again, the first step of this cycle is sin. Judges 6 starts out this way. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in the mountain clefts, the caves, and the strongholds. You read those verses and you get a, a real feeling for the helplessness and the devastation and the loneliness that the Israelites were feeling. The enemy was greater than they, they were. Their failure to turn to God left them vulnerable and they had to hide in the mountains in fear. Instead of in the lands down below that were theirs, that God had given them, that they had taken, they were hiding in fear because of their loneliness. And how long were they in the situation? Notice that. How long were they in that situation? Seven years. Seven years they were under the oppression of the Midianites. And this was the result of sin. They knew that their sins had separated them from God. They were outside of a relationship with God because they were living in sin. In his book called The Pressures Off, author Larry Crabb reminds us that we're surrounded by trouble. He, he basically lists three troubles that Christians are, are surrounded by. Number one, the world around us brings us trouble. Number two, the devil prowls towards us. And number three, the flesh that is within us. So the things around us, the devil coming at us, and what we are on the inside combined, no wonder we're in chaos. All of that can create a kind of perpetual chaos in our lives where we feel pressure and stress and conflict and fear and guilt and even shame. G.K. Chesterton was right when he said, whatever else is or is not true, this one thing is certain, mankind is not what he was meant to be. The people of Israel had taken comfort in their own strength to protect themselves, and the results were, well, a little less than adequate, and they always are against a strong enemy. The second thing that comes from, from the, in that cycle after sin is oppression. 
Verses 3 to 5 says, Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and other eastern peoples would invade the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza. There's the land that's in the news. And did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. See, the Midianites were a nomadic people. They were the first ones that we know of in ancient history to, to use the camel for military purposes because the camel could travel fast and far with little water and they could strike at will. Their mobility allowed them to make raiding parties to steal and to plunder and even kill. The people of God would work the land. They'd sow the seed and they'd watch as their, their seed sprang up and just as they were prepared for the harvest, the Midianites would wait until those fields were ripe and then they would swoop down on their camels and they would run the people of God from their land back up into the mountains again and God's people would hide themselves in the dens and the caves and all they could do was watch as the Midianites used their farm tools to reap the harvest for themselves. They didn't spare a living thing for Israel. Seven straight years they did this. Finally, they'd had enough. And that's the third step in the cycle, which is repentance. Verses 7 to 10, Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. And when the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said this, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and I gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. The Israelites were defenseless against these people and after seven years, they've learned their lesson and they're finally crying out for a deliverer. Sometimes we get caught up in the story. People who know the story of Gideon, we know of Gideon's fleeces. We know of Gideon's unusual battle at the end. We get caught up in the story. We forget about this unnamed prophet that we just read about here. An unnamed prophet who prepared the people for repentance and laid the groundwork for revival. But we cannot ignore the principle that this unnamed prophet gave. There can be no peace. Listen to that. There can be no peace in the world, in our nation, in our homes, in our families, until you recognize your need and repent of your sin and return back to God. That's when real peace happens. As one bumper sticker puts it, know Jesus, know peace. But if you know Jesus, then you will know peace. The fourth thing is the deliverer is provided. Verses 11 to 12, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah. I originally read that as Oprah, that is wrong. Under the oak in Ophrah, and that belonged to Joash the Abirzerite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. I love reading that. Every time I see that phrase, you mighty warrior, it brings a tickle. Because if you think about it, that's a little bit of dry humor. Mighty warrior indeed. We're first introduced Gideon here, threshing wheat in a wine press. Now you deal with grapes in a wine press. You deal with wheat in a threshing floor. Threshing separates the the heavier grain from the lighter shaft and the the wind that comes through blows it away, leaving you just with the wheat below. And you need open air and you need a good breeze for that. But a wine press, a wine press was made out of stone, was built underground. It was where the grapes were pressed to get the good grape juice. So where, why would we find Gideon in deep in this wine press threshing his wheat when he needed to be above ground? It's because he was afraid. Normally, folks thresh wheat on a threshing floor made of wood, and they use cattle to tread it. There's no mention of animals here. It's such a small amount of wheat. Apparently, he needs no help from an animal. But Israel was desperate. And in desperate times, we do desperate things. So why was he threshing wheat in the wine press? The mighty Gideon, the mighty warrior, was hiding. He was trying to keep the Midianites from realizing that he had some grain. Now, I'm not making fun of him. I would be hiding as well. But the mighty warrior was in the wine press threshing his grain when the angel of the Lord appeared. He's defeated. He's discouraged. He's filled with doubts and fears. Many times in my own life, I am defeated or feel defeated and discouraged. And my life is filled with doubts and fears as well. 
And the angel of the Lord appears and said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, who is this angel of the Lord? Most commentators believe that this is what's known as a theophany or a pre-Bethlehem presence of Jesus Christ. Yeah, Jesus Christ was still around even before Bethlehem. And this is one of those times when he came before. And how do we know things? Uh, Well, there's things like this. In 614, it says, The Lord turned to him and said, Go in strength. And the Lord, notice all caps, and we've looked before that when the Lord is in all caps, that is Jehovah God or Uh, Yahweh, the Lord himself was there. And Gideon, when Gideon realized, verses 22, 23, that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord. Alas, Jehovah, God. I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said, Peace, don't be afraid. You're not going to die. Now why would Gideon feel that he was going to die just because he saw an angel of the Lord? He was probably thinking of Exodus 33.20, which said, but he said, you cannot see my face for no one may see me and live. He was scared. He had just seen God. And the Exodus says, you will die. And so he was scared. But God said, peace, shalom, you will not die. Well, he responds, pardon me, my Lord. Lowercase. Gideon replied, but if the Lord, uppercase, is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hands of Midian. He's basically saying, wait a minute, how, how can we have peace? How can we have success when you've given us over to the Midianites? Do you see what he's doing there? Who is he blaming for the mess? God. We know the cycle. We see it seven times in this book. It starts with sin. It starts with doing what God doesn't want you to do. That's how they got themselves in the mess. But Gideon's saying, why would you just abandon us like that? And he blames God. But God is not daunted. And notice he never even answers Gideon's why questions. He simply gives him a command. He says, go. I want you to go. And here's his reply again. "Uh, Pardon me, Lord. I would would kind of get sick of that phrase every time Gideon said, pardon me, my Lord, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. It's like he's saying, look, God, I'm the youngest guy in my family, okay? And my family is the weakest link in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and Manasseh's the smallest tribe in all of the... Why, why me? I don't think I have it in me to lead and save the nation of Israel. Gideon still didn't get it. God was going to save Israel. He was going to use Gideon. So we can look at ourselves and say, but God can't use me because I'm, and fill in the blank. I'm too something or not enough something. And Gideon tried that, but God said, no, I will lead the nation of Israel out and I will use you. I love in 1 Corinthians 1, you may be familiar with this passage, where I can feel comfortable in the fact that even though I'm a nothing, I can take comfort in the fact that God is a specialist in using nobodies to do great work. It says, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one can boast before him. God uses us no matter who and how we are well Gideon then had the gall to first ask for the first of several signs you may know the phrase Gideon's fleece well this wasn't a fleece but it was Gideon on the road to asking for things he replied if I have now found favor in your eyes give me a sign that it's really you talking to me please don't go away till I come back and bring my offering and I set it before you Well, Gideon went inside, he prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour he made bread without yeast, and he put the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot, and he brought them out and offered it to him under the oak. And the Lord said, I will wait until your return. Now, Gideon was probably hoping no one would be there when he got back with his offering, but there he was, still sitting under the oak tree, and he was going to give Gideon the sign that he had asked for. The angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consumed the meat and the bread and the angel of the Lord disappeared. Now that would be good enough sign for me. I bring my offering 
bring it, set it before him. He tells me to put it on the rock, pour the broth all over it. That'll make it good and, good and wet, right? And now step back. And fire comes out of the rock, comes out of nowhere, and consumes the entire offering. And then the angel of the Lord flat out disappears. That would catch my attention. For Gideon, apparently it did as well. He said, when Gideon realized it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there, and he called it the Lord is shalom. The Lord is peace. Shalom, Gideon. Peace to you. You've no doubt heard the word shalom before. It's probably the most well-known Hebrew word out there. But many of us really don't understand its full meaning because in English, there is no equivalent word. It's not just peace. Peace out kind of thing. It's a very rich, rich word. Shalom is used in Israel as both a greeting and as a goodbye. It's the best blessing of one's life. It's the result, if you've heard of the number six priestly blessing, it's the result of the blessing. Number six says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. That's the result of the blessing. There's no single English word that communicates it properly. The general ideas of completion and fulfillment, it brings with it a sense of wholeness and harmony in our relationships, especially our relationship with God. Gideon to hear shalom from God meant that he was at peace with the Holy One. This is the first and as far as I know, the only time we see the combination of the word Jehovah and Shalom. Jehovah Shalom. God is our peace. The great I am is the perfect peace. We also see in scripture though, even though that phrase is not in scripture, that Jehovah Shalom is in the Trinity itself. We've got God the Father called in Hebrews God of peace. We've got God Son, Isaiah, called the Prince of Peace. And we've got God the Spirit, called in Romans, the Spirit of Peace. He truly is the Jehovah Shalom. Can you ever identify with Gideon? I know I can. Do you ever find yourself overcome by fear sometimes? Doubting God's promises and purposes for your life? Are you ever living in fear? You're walled in by a set of circumstances in your life and you don't know how to unravel it all. Are you discouraged, thinking you're too weak to go on, too insignificant to get help from God? If so, it's time to meet Jehovah Shalom and start building your altar. And in the last few minutes here, we'll, we'll see how to do that. That altar to God. First thing we need to do is pursue peace no matter the cost. Gideon was dissatisfied with his life and he was longing for a change. And God met Gideon at the point of his greatest need. And that's what God does sometimes in our lives. He doesn't force himself on us. Like the father and the prodigal son, God lets us go our own way and experience life without him. God will allow you to feed at the trough of the world. God lets us get our fill of the world, our fill of sin and rebellion, our fill of doing things our own ways until we grow sick of it. Ramsay MacDonald, the one-time prime minister of England, was discussing with another government official the idea of, the possibility of lasting peace in the world. The other gentleman, an expert on foreign affairs himself, just kind of sneered and was unimpressed by the prime minister's idealism. He remarked, the desire for peace does not necessarily ensure it. And MacDonald admitted, saying this is quite true, but neither does the desire for food satisfy your hunger, but at least it gets you started towards finding food. Let your present situation and circumstances fuel your desire to experience God's peace. You need to realize that dark, desperate situations and times are used by God to create in us a longing and a desire for peace. It's a time to turn our hearts back toward home. God is waiting. Whether we know it or not, intimacy with God is the highest priority in life for any human being and every human being on this earth. Determined to pursue the path that leads home, that leads to a life of peace. The second thing is to eliminate the need, the enemies, I should say, of peace. Verse 1 tells us that instead of pursuing peace, Israel was pursuing sin, its own will and wants and disobedience. They did all of this, it says, in the sight of the Lord. They knew he was watching and didn't care. Israel was foolish to think that they could live in disobedience to God and at the same time experience his peace 
his prosperity, and his blessing. God will never stop loving you, but he will not grant you his peace as you walk in willful sin. 1 John 1 says this in the beginning, 6, 7, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. There's not one trace of darkness or sin in God. When we then choose to walk in darkness, when we choose to associate with sinful people and participate in sinful pleasures, we're going to forfeit something. What is it we're going to forfeit? We forfeit fellowship and peace with God and participate in sinful pleasures. We're going to forfeit that peace and fellowship not only with God but with the fellowship of others. Thirdly, ask God to remove all sin and doubt in our lives. John continues on, If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You need to accept your inability to change without God's help. Gideon was not one of the great ones of Israel. He was a farmer. He was working in his father's field. Gideon was the lowest and weakest member in his family, and that family was the lowest and weakest in the weakest tribe of all of Israel. But God deliberately chose Gideon not because he was strong, but because he was weak. All Gideon had to do was follow orders. Peace comes when you shift off the burden off of your shoulders and onto God's shoulders. As long as we rely on our own strength, on our own way, we will give up peace. Oftentimes we attempt to make things happen, to make things work out our own way in our own time. But until we yield the control of our lives to God and trust in his power and his timing and his way, we will never find peace. What was the turning point in Gideon's heart and life? It's found in the first three words of verse 22. When Gideon realized, it says, when Gideon realized, Gideon, see, he got it. He realized that God was not dead. He realized that God had not forgotten them. He realized that God had not ceased to love and to care. True peace is found only in a proper and right relationship with God. We can't expect to find peace in any other person, any other time, any other place. Jesus told his disciples and he tells us, I have told you these things so that you may have in me peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. When you're in a battle and don't think you can win, remember Jehovah Shalom is with you. He will fight your battles. When you're overwhelmed by life and you can't see a way out, remember Jehovah Shalom is with you. He will make a way. When you're struggling with sin and you don't think you can overcome, remember Jehovah Shalom is with you. He will cause you to overcome it. When Jehovah Shalom promises his power and his presence, victory will be accomplished. When the Lord is with you, everything not some things. Everything is possible. Every day you need to recommit yourself to God's peace. Remember your altar. In a real sense, after Gideon built his altar to Jehovah Shalom, his troubles were actually just beginning. But he had God. He had his peace. We do not have time this morning, certainly. But if you read the remainders of chapter 6 and chapter 7 and chapter 8 of Judges, you'll discover that Gideon faced three challenges head on and did so successfully. First, God instructed Gideon to destroy the groves of the Asherah. This was a a dangerous and challenging thing. Those were his dad's groves. His dad was one of the members of that cult religion, and here he was instructed to take them down. And with that, ultimately, Gideon's father takes a stand for Jehovah and challenges Baal to contend for himself. God is already at work turning Israel around, and he's beginning with Gideon's father and his family. Secondly, Gideon's still not sure, and you may remember some of the the fleeces that Gideon put out. And thirdly, in chapters 7 and 8, Gideon assembles an army of 32,000 men ready to fight for God. But God, remember, if you know the story, had other ideas. God commanded Gideon to whittle down the army to 300, not 32,000. All those who were afraid, dismissed. All those who drank carelessly were sent home. God wanted those who drank cautiously, not taking their eyes off of potential threats. So he reduced it down to 300 men. And God wins the battle against an army of 125,000 Midianites with an army of Gideon, 300 soldiers, and God. God is teaching Gideon, Israel, and us a lesson here. God is 
teaching us that his peace can fill our hearts and lives in the midst of overwhelming and fearful circumstances. Problems are inevitable. Worries and anxieties, however, are optional. God can give you peace, but it doesn't come from absence of conflict. It comes from his presence in your life. Truly, God is Jehovah Shalom, a God of peace. God can give you peace in the midst of your battles, in the midst of your doubts, in the midst of your fears. Are you here with peace today? It's time to build yourself an altar. There's no peace apart from Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Jesus came to take that sin and that is in your life and he nailed it to the cross. Today you can have peace of God in your heart and life. Come today and claim the name Jehovah Shalom. No Jesus, no peace. But if you know Jesus, you will know peace. Let us pray. Father God, it's at this time that we come together again and we're reminded from your word that you are the Jehovah Shalom. You are the Lord, our peace. We can search for it in all the wrong places and we can spend, and many of us do, our entire lifetimes searching in all the wrong places. But your word says if we're to find lasting peace, if we're to find true peace, that can only be found in you. Help us, Father, to know that, to realize it, to hang on to it, to grasp it with all our life. Because just like with Gideon, the rest of our life is sure to have problems and trials and difficult circumstances. But when we know you, when we know you as Jehovah Shalom, then we can have peace through it all. Not because the trials are not there, but because you're there in the midst of it as well. We thank you for all this, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.